Welcome to this episode of We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks for joining us. The tight labor market continues to be a challenge for businesses, even as that has been taken over by concerns about inflation. Households are struggling to keep up with rising costs, and many local businesses, still struggling to recover from the pandemic, aren't even breaking even. What are the short and long-term impacts of these twin economic crises, and how do they affect Americans' financial security? Our guest on this episode of We the People has just the expertise to address these questions. Scott Niederjohn is a nationally recognized economist and scholar who was recently appointed to lead the Concordia University Free Enterprise Center. He's been extensively published in economic journals, is a Fulbright scholar, and is a four-time recipient of the Governor's Financial Literacy Award. Welcome, Scott. It's great to have you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you, Rick. Let's jump in. Uh, and let's start with something that's uh, really affecting all sectors of the economy, and that's inflation, Scott. Uh, the cost of everything has gone up, which is obviously a, a blow to businesses. In fact, the owner of a restaurant here in Milwaukee recently said that the price to make one of her popular dishes has more than doubled. And that's before factoring in labor and other expenses. What's the short and long-term impact of sustained inflation? Yeah, you know, inflation is often referred to as a tax that, that no one voted for. Um, and the economy is in a unique place with, with price increases being driven by both supply and demand-related disruptions uh, and considerations. On the supply side, uh, we have issues stemming from pandemic-related labor shortages, and I think we'll probably talk more about that together today. And we have these supply chain issues around the world affecting everything from food uh, to semiconductors. On the demand side, uh, we had a very fast recovery after a pandemic. Um, we opened the economy quickly, and that really impacted the demand for goods, as there was some restrictions still for services. Things like travel are still uh, challenging, but people were flush with money from savings, um, and some huge government stimulus uh, programs. And you add to that very accommodative monetary policy from the Federal Reserve with, with very low interest rates. And you have lots of demand for good. So in the short term, you know, I think inflation causes issues for lots of people, for almost every group, but seniors in particular on fixed incomes. Even though Social Security was um, uh, indexed to inflation and they'll get a raise, it's a very small piece Right. of most retirees' incomes, lower income folks are also really punished by inflation. Because if you think about it, they spend almost all of their income on consumption, consumption of goods and services. And when you have things like food and gas and rent and electricity rising so quickly, it's consuming ever more uh, of their already limited budgets. And then as you pointed out, Rick, businesses have to deal with rising costs. Um, rising price, raising price on the consumer, which can be sometimes impossible, but always troubling. Um, and then even like little transaction costs, like you own a restaurant, you have to maybe redo your menu frequently because prices are always rising, rising quickly. So that's the short term stuff. Long term, you know, I think the big issue is if we get entrenched inflation like we had in the 1970s and early 1980s. And that can become this process of a self-fulfilling expectation. You know, we've already seen some indications of a wage price kind of spiral. Uh, places like John Deere, who just recently renegotiated a very large union contract, built in indexes to inflation. Those kinds of things can become something where we start to expect inflation. So we ask for raises and we get more inflation. So on the positive side, I think the Fed it recently has started to see that issue and really has taken, taken inflation a little more seriously. So uh, hopefully, this long-term issue does not become um, become entrenched. Let's talk specifically about the labor market, which just seems to be tight everywhere. Uh, on one hand, workers can probably afford to be more choosy, and, and most people who are looking for a job can find a job. Uh, but on the other hand, it's deterring economic growth. I, I know companies have said that they could grow their business by up to 50% if they just could find some workers, given that. Uh, is the tight labor market a good thing or a bad thing? And, and how long do you think it'll last? Yeah, you know, President Truman famously said he wanted a one-armed economist because he was so tired of this on the one hand, on the <laughs> other hand kind of answer from his advisors. But I think like your question indicates, there's this trade-off uh, in this very unique 
labor situation we're in right now. Uh, we learned on Friday that U.S. labor costs grew last year at the fastest pace uh, in two decades. And while beneficial to workers, particularly those in service-oriented jobs, um, and many of them, of course, have struggled with low wages and low benefits for some time, nonetheless, their, wa- their raises are oftentimes being swamped uh, by these raises in prices we just talked about. Uh, and many appear to be frequently changing jobs uh, to improve their pay, to improve their lifestyle. There are currently more open jobs today, Rick, than there are unemployed people. Uh, and this quit rate, you know, that is those who voluntarily leave their job is at an all-time high. Um, so I think the shortage of workers, though, really points to larger issues, um, part demographic, uh, part pandemic related, but also part misguided government policy. So the demographic piece We've had an aging population for quite some time. We've had uh, baby boomers retiring more quickly than young people enter the workforce to replace them. And the pandemic exacerbated that. And the indications are that many people near retirement uh, chose to retire a little bit early uh, because the pandemic and maybe because the stock market was so strong that gave them the ability to do that. But clearly some still worry about the virus and childcare. And when schools close, that causes again, more issues there. But I think the most concerning thing for us as Americans um, is this labor force participation rate. That is the share of adults who are working or looking for work. Uh, in December, it was 61.9%. That's still one and a half points below the pre-pandemic. And it's well below the peak of 67% in 2000. So this means millions of Americans, fewer Americans are working or looking for work. Uh, and maybe most troubling This is particularly acute in what we call the prime working age, say men, which is between 25 and 54. In 1961, 97% of men in that age group were working looking for work. Today, it's like 88%. That means that one in eight men in that prime age group are choosing not to work. And that's a lot of missing workers. Um, And the Bureau of Labor Statistics does this time use survey. And what they find is those who choose not to work also choose not to be part of civil society, go to church, be active in their communities. These are all things that make life fulfilling um, and those things aren't aren't occurring. So while this has clearly been a longer term trend, I suspect that some of the pandemic related government programs that provided incentives not to work, um, federal vaccine mandates, these have all contributed to the problem. Um, And while it's complex, the fact is there are more open jobs than we've ever had. And if you wanna work, you can work. Um, so I'm not sure how long this will last, but I do think the end of some of these pandemic related programs will, will help. Also, there's no doubt that people who have chosen not to work have been burning through some of their savings from, uh, earlier we've, we've, and they'll have to start thinking about working. So, you know, I really also hope we'll be a little bit smarter about immigration. I think there's some ways that could help this problem too, but yeah, it's a real concern. I think it's a serious issue. Some troubling trends. Let's switch gears a little bit and and talk about financial literacy, which is something that you've spent a lot of time on. Uh, I know a recent survey found that 56% of Americans can't cover a $1,000 emergency expense from savings. And for sure, part of the reason is rising costs, which just makes it harder for people to save. Uh, But is part of it also a lack of understanding on on just how to build wealth? And, And if that's the case, how do we fix that? Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, tough one. Yeah, I mean, many of you watching this might conclude this seems like a role for parents, right? I mean, financial literacy really is just a specialized form of making good decisions, making good choices. Um, yet it's obvious that isn't happening. Surveys show that parents uh, are very uncomfortable talking with their kids about money, probably because of their own lack of knowledge and confidence. I think one thing that seems to help, and I've thought about this for a long time and worked on it, is emphasizing economic and financial education in our schools. Um, The economic way of thinking really emphasizes the idea of choices and costs and incentives, and I think helps people make decisions generally uh, better. But with anything you take seriously in education, say math or reading, we would teach it over and over again, right? We don't expect students to master mathematics through a one semester high school class. But that's largely how we teach econ and personal finance if we teach it all. We teach it at all. So I think it would make some sense to infuse economics and financial literacy uh, across the school's curriculum, starting at an early age and doing it in lots of places, math, reading, history. It would also be helpful, I think, for our leaders to model prudent financial behavior, though. What signal does it send 
to have massive national debts with no plan to, to pay them down? Or how about all this talk of eliminating student debt? What does that suggest about being financially responsible, taking on debts that you just want the government to pay for you? Good point. Um, or, or even the way we talk about entrepreneurs and business people. Um, they're, we tend to tell us, say, they're not paying their fair share in taxes, or we should have this kind of stakeholder capitalism. What if instead we learn from the way that successful men and women have built their wealth for themselves, and not just for themselves, but for so many others, and view their contribution to society as honorable? I think that would, frankly, go a long way to demasking financial literacy as not some secret for people. Great ideas. Our free market system has been under scrutiny and pressure from both the left and the right. As the leader of a center that's focused on promoting the ideals of free enterprise, why do you think it's critical for Americans to understand the benefits of free enterprise? Well, first, because it works. Um, And and no other system (laughs) in human history has lifted more people out of poverty than free markets and private enterprise. Um, And the system is the system that's most consistent with human dignity and freedom. Um, Those who benefit the most from free markets are those without wealth or prestigious credentials or class advantages. Um, One can only prosper in a free enterprise system if they find a way to serve others. You can't coerce people uh, into buying products or services. We've known this since really Adam Smith, uh, a moral philosopher, explained this 250 years ago. But this, to me, stands in sharp contrast to the more the co- coercive nature of a socialist system that uh, is really associated generally with misery, uh, falling living standards, really even death. Um, it's estimated that Joseph Stalin was responsible for six to nine million people were killed under his centrally planned economy just to keep it in place. And look at Cuba or Venezuela. So it's amazing to me how many people are more concerned about inequality than they are with poverty. And I think that comes from a misunderstanding of free enterprise. Free enterprise at its core is about uh, cooperation, morality, voluntary exchange, mutual beneficial uh, transactions. That sounds like something we ought to be encouraging. Um, You know, people talk about economics as being the dismal science, but if you really concentrate on the free enterprise aspect of it, it's very hopeful. Uh, The the late Julian Simon uh, economist said, He cared most about the ultimate resource. And what he meant by that was people, especially, he said, skilled, spirited, and hopeful young people endowed with liberty who will exert their wills and imaginations for their own benefit and inevitably benefit the rest of us. So I guess to answer your question, what could be more important or impactful than understanding something like this, right? At least to our prosperity and human flourishing. Great answer. Scott, last question. How does the Concordia University Free Enterprise Center, which you've just undertaken the leadership of, intend to fulfill its mission? Yeah, uh, Murray Rothbard famously said, uh, it's no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is, after all, a specialized discipline and one that most will consider to be a dismal science, but is totally irresponsible to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in a state of ignorance. So, I think that quote summarizes our mission of our center. We want to help people not be ignorant about economics and the benefits of free enterprise. And we try to accomplish this through uh, research, education, application, and and public policy. Uh, We have a a national speaker series that brings in thought leaders to campus from around the country. We run a Liberty, Faith, and Economics Summit each fall that's designed to really to model the lost art of civil discourse. We intentionally bring in speakers with a diversity of opinions, and we allow students to reflect on how you can have an actual dialogue around controversial topics uh, in a constructive way. You know, and then lastly, we really try to run programs uh, for students in the wider community, and I'm probably the most proud of this program we have called Economics for Opinion Leaders. The idea being that there's lots of groups, clergy, journalists, teachers, who have almost no formal training in economics. So we try to, through a short workshop, uh, give them some of those tools to not only understand economics, but because they influence others, appreciate uh, the contribution. So the last thing I would say is we also try to think about the application of free markets. So give students the chance to try being an entrepreneur while in college. So we have some pitch competitions where they can uh, pitch an idea for a business. We even have some real venture funding if they're successful. 
And what a great way to learn about entrepreneurship while you're a student. Um, and I think these programs are kind of like the manifestation of free enterprise uh, in practice or in the real world. Well, very exciting prospects. I know it's great for those of us that live in southeastern Wisconsin, but it, it really could serve as a model for the entire country and higher education generally. So, Scott Niederjohn, thank you for your great work at Concordia. Thank you for your contributions to a, a stronger higher education system in our country. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People. <laughs>